Okay, I gotta start this one with an apology. Yeah, that too. But more importantly, I know I promised LeVar Burton in this episode, but next time, we'll get to him. Trust me, I really want to get to him. It's amazing. It practically justifies this whole series. But there's extenuating circumstances. Weird ones. Yes, even for this show. As I mentioned at the beginning of this series, it seems that only 12 of the 13 commissioned episodes of Deadly Games have survived to this day. But on top of that, the episodes aired wildly out of order. Without spoiling, the biggest tell is that the fourth episode to air was The End of Jackal. And that's not a fake-out title. It's literally the final episode of the main story arc where Jackal gets deleted. Things that make you go, hmm. So while that's weird, I hadn't realized until one of our Patreon live streams just how truly hornswoggled the rest of the airing order is. Because as near as we can tell, episode 3 in the original production and story order was 12th to hit air. And while this show wasn't written with super tight continuity... Which was the style at the time? It does have continuity, and a nine-episode jump is a bit much even by this show's atrophied standards. Especially when there's bits of dialogue and props that confirm the original story order. So because it's my show and I make the rules, we'll be handling things in what I think is the original intended order, with a full breakdown of the airing order debacle once everything is in place. Well, mostly in place. What with that missing episode. <sighs> I do this to myself. The game is about Jacko, life, and his quest to destroy life as we know it. Everyone in the game is based on someone I know. The Cold Steel Kid, as I live and breathe. Which, son of a gun, I'm doing, aren't I? If you get past this level, you'll still have your hands full with the others. We start with Gus barely able to eat because of a painful cavity, and James Culvert delivers it with enough acting chops that I get sympathy pains. Yeah, the early parts of this episode are hard for me to watch because I have severe issues with teeth. Yes, I have them, and no, I don't have to explain my anatomy to you. <laughs> ah! Alright. I'll call Jerry, we'll get my cavity filled, and live a normal life. Would you settle for two out of three? Oh yeah, that's why I'm here. Jackal's got an offer to make. What do you say we go for the whole ball of wax? Pick a card. You take the high card, I'll call the whole game off. Call the game off? What if the high card's yours? You will only win a smaller silver fiddle. Also, I guess I'll kill one of you, uh, him. <laughs> I want that card deck. And wait a minute. Where did this come from, anyway? Jackal's actions are dictated by the game coding Gus gave him. Did Gus forget that he added a crappy, unfun card-based filler minigame in his action game? Actually, that's pretty on par with a lot of 90s home console and PC games, and Gus is constantly forgetting his own game's important elements, so never mind. Objection retracted. No, that's it. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he calls it. Peter, I've got a king, okay? There's only four cards that can beat me. Yeah, but it's Jackal's deck, Gus. The, the rest of the deck could be aces. It's a fair deck, kid. Trust me. Forget it. Get out of here. Oh, kid. Get that cavity taken care of. But take my advice. Skip the Novocaine. <laughs> no, no. Wow. And now the kill counter is on both their heads. Yeah, we're getting to that. Character actor Stuart Pankin takes a break from being Earl Sinclair on dinosaurs to chew scenery and donuts as a charming dentist with a sweet tooth. Man, it seems like every bit player in this show has more credits on their IMDb page than our three main heroes put together. And now we meet the episode's guest boss, Dr. Kramer. He's played by Christopher Neem. Neemy? Neem? Oh mm, eh, well. A British actor who has been Kaiser Wilhelm, Romeo Montague, and three unrelated characters on MacGyver. He was on the British TV series Colditz, and despite what you're about to see, he apparently never played a Nazi. Are you aware that your lower incisors are uniformly discolored? Their fillings closed. The supply of nitrous oxide. Where is that gift? By the way, the receptionist is dead Ola. Dr. Kramer doesn't kill Jerry because of the reasons, locking him in the closet and taking his place in an ultimately failed attempt to murder Gus. 
Can you guess his non-lethal weakness? Huh. That's bizarrely obvious. For Gus. Who'd have thought to be donuts in a dentist's office? But the attack is actually a tertiary goal. The main goal to steal a whole bunch of nitrous oxide. Which he does. Meanwhile... Lauren is trying to encourage an old comedian friend of hers named Phil to come out of retirement. He's played by Jerry Stiller, and I'm not even going to bother telling you any of the billion things you know him from. He's an old comic legend. Phil is, I mean. I mean, so is Jerry, but... Uh, anyway. She's trying to convince him to get up on stage again. He fears that he'll be dated and unrelatable, and that his legacy will be destroyed by a poor... Don't no call it come back. Gus does what he does best and complicates an emotional situation with his essential Gusness. Did you just refer to me as a master strategist? Well, you are. You map out for yourself a great career and quit on top. How many people do that? I'd like to pause and talk about this for a moment, because this is one of the times Gus's Jack Hollery actually ties into his character progression. Gus is very focused on accomplishment and greatness. It's one of his core character flaws, and he has a very particular narrow view of it. Phil represents the kind of legacy Gus wants, one that is written in stone and cannot be taken away, but Gus cannot see the point of accomplishment beyond, well, the actual accomplishment. For example, once he got married, he didn't do anything to maintain his relationship and thus lost it. Learning that victories and defeats aren't final is at the core of Gus's character arc, and it might have been meaningfully explored if this show had been written after the advent of TiVo. Another interesting thing to note is that Lauren's history with Phil is never explained. He's just an old friend from a completely different generation and career. Maybe they met because she's a reporter, but the relationship seems extremely significant, bordering on parental. If you told me he was her dad, I would believe it. Not often a show gives one of the ladies a purely platonic older male friend that isn't explicitly stated to be a mentor or relative. Accidental progressiveness? I'll take it. What's the kid shooting back? That's a turbo drill. See, Dr. Kramer has to be drilled. That's how he's beaten. Sugar works, too. You know, donuts, candy, doesn't matter what form. Won't kill him, but it'll hurt him real good. Drills and sugar because he's a dentist. Wow, really clever. At least this actually makes sense for once. And just so you know, Kramer's not a dentist. He's an orthodontist. <laughs> Orthodontists don't drill or use Novocaine. I'm afraid she makes a worthy point, my friend. It was an early level, all right? I was experimenting. I just knew that teeth would play a major role. Since Lauren's already done the berating for me, I gotta hand it to Gus. He is so devoted to his pissy little revenge game that he refuses to give a real-world tormentor a new yet related job for the sake of the game's narrative simplicity. You know, when X-Men 3 came out, Gus had a lengthy rant on his WordPress blog about how the Juggernaut wasn't a mutant in the comics. So Gus programmed Dr. Kramer to try and kill a famous comedian in order to destroy laughter. Gus has issues. How can he do that anyway? How can Kramer destroy laughter? Those tanks of nitrous oxide he stole from Jerry. Nitrous oxide is an anesthesia. It's also known as laughing gas. I know what laughing gas is, Gus. Tell me why he stole it. He's going to modify the nightside air conditioning system and pump the gas into the studio. Um, that's bad, right? Extremely bad. See, in large doses, nitrous oxide takes the place of oxygen in the blood cells. These people would literally laugh themselves to death. Really? Uh, yeah. Jim? Sorry about the interruptus here, but this bit is kind of sort of accurate. Just not in the way they meant. Nitrous oxide is dangerous for secondhand breathers, which can pose a hazard for employees in dentist offices with poor circulation. Pumping it intentionally into a sealed room full of people probably would kill them all, but through normal type lack of oxygen asphyxiation. It doesn't actually make people laugh uncontrollably, just more relaxed and desensitized to pain, with the occasional euphoric episode. Thus its reputation as laughing gas. So they're only half right here. Huh, informative. Better than their usual ratio. And why do you know that? Nothing. Okay then, let's get to the filler bit of the episode, both in terms of runtime and that Jacqueline and Kramer are after silver fillings to use them as solder for the nitrous device. Yeah, that's a pretty limp justification for what boils down to a fetch quest, but at least it's thematic. So what's their first stop? A kid's birthday party, of course. 
Wait, what? Oh, apologies, young man. But Barney was unable to join us today. But in his place, however, we present Dr. Kramer, the funny orthodontist. Well, that's one way to avoid paying a licensing fee to PBS. At any rate, the most easily entertained and forgiving disappointed children in history are spared torture only because one of the parents has a bunch of fillings to steal. Open. Wider. Trust me. Dr. Kramer's on screen. Okay, that was effectively dark. On the way, Gus lamely justifies this week's grudge by claiming that his dental headgear made him unpopular, while throwing shade at Lauren for not being a bitter, sniveling shit in school. We all had something, Gus. I was flat chest until the 10th grade. But you don't hear me going on whining about Donna Caruso, the slut. How she pulled the Kleenex out of my bra right in front of Robbie McIntyre. Hey, Gus. The fact that you don't know this about the woman you married is reason 4,622 that that marriage failed. I swear, if he's hurting any of these kids, I'm going to throw myself in front of him. But Let me tell you something, Gus. You can croak any way you choose when this thing is all done, but until then, don't you dare leave me alone. Well, that's an effective way to put the kibosh on the whole refuse-to-call part of the hero's journey. Gus and Lauren use the excuse that they're reporters to get in and ask questions. Since Lauren is herself a reporter, you'd think they'd do this every episode. This would be a bit more forgivable if this was meant to be episode 12, and that they'd actually realize that they could have made their lives a lot easier all this time. But not so much when it's done in episode 3, and never done again! Daddy, can you wiggle and scream so the rabbit can see? I just wanted to share that moment with you. In fact, let's see it again! Daddy, can you wiggle and scream so the rabbit can see? Ah, <sighs> beautiful. Kramer's short two fillings, so we get a scene of Gus explaining his Moon Logic game design that leads to a sequence in a movie theater because I guess they had access to that set that week. Also, you can tell this was shot in a different era, given Gus is casually walking around in public with a goddamn crossbow. It was a little stash home. Oh, yeah. Excuse me, could you please remove your hat? No. I can't tell you how hard it is not to just make these videos a montage of Christopher Lloyd being wonderful. <laughs> You're getting cocky, kid. <laughs> That's been a problem for you in the past. And he's gonna fall right now. Pretty nifty, don't you think? It's a hologram. I forgot about the hologram. How could you forget about the hologram? There are 30,000 different directives in this game. <laughs> I can't remember all of them. Do you not keep documentation? Jeez, we keep lists for our running gags, and we're an E-list YouTube series. Kramer and Jackal escape, having obtained the fillings from the projectionist, so Gus tries to get the Target's live show for the night cancelled. Which really isn't super clear, but honestly, it's the least of this episode's problems. He attends a comedian audition with the producer, which is weird since you think the lineup would already be set by now, leading to a belabored, explaining the premise of the show scene that's supposed to be character building, I think? It goes about as well as you expect. Well, of course, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I mean, this is a joke. The scene really works if you imagine Gus as being one of any number of YouTube celebrities caught being douche nozzles. <sighs> Kramer's on the roof. Gus pulls off a successful kill. Oh. We did it. We did it, Gus! Oh. <laughs> You've destroyed my good friend, Dr. Kramer, leaving me to lick my wounds and look forward to another day. And we're only halfway through this, and Jackal's being glorious, so obviously there's more going on. Kid, remember 18 seconds. Da 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 da! Well, it was a pleasure doing business with you, Doc. And here's our proof that this was, in fact, the third episode of the series. And look at the other levels in this shot. The coach, sure. The milkman? Milkman? That profession was obsolete decades prior to this game. Wait, is Gus that kid from the Measuring Man short? That was made in 1970. Gus is seemingly in his early 30s in 1995, and that would explain a lot. And then look at the bottom there. Level 93? Sweet genius! Nixon's enemy list wasn't this extensive. And why aren't those tapes in level order? 
And yes, I'm ignoring for the moment the blatantly obvious. I'm really trying not to be a crank here, but this is one of the show's biggest stumbling blocks outside of its central character's unlikability. Namely, the fact that our heroes are completely reactive in a situation where they actually have a literal game plan. Every episode, they scramble to remember the boss's weaknesses, scramble to find the materials, typically after someone innocent is already dead. But the first episode established that Gus knows the bosses, follow the level designs he wrote, and this episode implies they come in level order. They could research and stock up ahead of time. Having our heroes be so damn clueless as to their own game's mechanics until maximum drama is just pointless. And it's unnecessary. The show has already established that Jackal has a degree of sideways thinking, and while he has to follow the plan of the level, he can employ wordplay to change things up and keep them guessing. The kitchen can also be the boiler room. This level is all about that kind of misdirection. We don't need the heroes to be so wholly ill-prepared. It doesn't make Jackal look better when his opponents are incredibly inept. Because, for me to benefit, we all have to sacrifice. Of course, when I say we, I'm not actually referring to myself. That 18 seconds. Ah, he's just playing mind games with me. Well, what did he mean? I wrestled in junior high school. At one point, I was undefeated and probably pretty obnoxious about it here. When I met Paul the Wall McMyers, it took all of 18 seconds to fold me in half. Hmm. The worst part was my father in the bleachers cheering against me. Well, apparently, Paul the Wall deserved to win because he put the effort in it. Well, I, on the other hand, was and always would be an underachiever. You never met my father. I suppose he has his good points. Yeah, this is actually important, like, to the whole series. More on that later in the production order. Yep, the real target is Phil's comedy night. Jack will sabotage the AC, and only after Lauren spots Jacqueline makes a call does Peter, who's supposed to be the smart one, think, hey, maybe that tape I saw before is relevant. Who's Sharon? When I broke down the Kramer level, I gave him a partner. Except for the dress, they're identical programs. That's why I ended up dropping her. But if you dropped her, how come she's still in the game? She was a backup file. She must have crossed over in the accident like all the others. Jackal let us be Kramer. He knew I'd forgotten about Sharon. Not to take anything away from Jackal, but I don't think he had to explicitly know that. So far, it's been demonstrably safe to merely guess that you forgot major details about your elaborate revenge masturbation game. Sharon, Dr. Kramer's sub-boss, is played by Marjorie Monaghan, probably best known as number one, the leader of the Mars Resistance in Babylon 5, and she has exactly zero lines. Lauren tries to evacuate the building, but... I know what you're thinking. Normally, I'm all for a rousing full salon, but not tonight. Pretty sure this isn't breaking the rules of the game. Jackal can't interfere directly with the kid, and Lauren is technically an NPC, so fair game. We get another scene of Gus failing to get anyone to take the premise of the show seriously. You're gonna need a power drill just to stop her. Let's go. Or at the very least, some kind of processed sugar product. We'll get right on it, sir. And another person is killed. Hey, what are you doing? Hey! Uh. And Phil starts his show in the gas-filled room. This is kind of unpleasant. It's not offensive or anything, but Phil's not getting honest laughs, which really undermines his entire subplot. Even if you use the more accurate idea that the audience is just kind of doped up, they're more susceptible to laugh at anything, funny or not. Though, if you trade the nitrous out for THC, you have the secret of Adult Swim's success. Long-time viewers may remember that I had said that we didn't have all of this episode. But, thanks to the awesome Isle of Rangoon fan, Matt Hudson, we now have the ending to this episode. Thanks, Matt! There's a... Tense? Shoot out on the roof of the building? But this time Lauren gets the kill with some clever use of the environment. The gas is shut off, Phil has his confidence back, plus the approval of the producer, and Jackal has a few last words for Goss. That was a close one. Wanna quit? I think not, kid. The occasional fluke aside, my ultimate victory is a foregone conclusion. You know, to be honest, I don't remember programming you to be so full of crap. You know, sometimes, kid, I wonder if you know 
why you program me. Da 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 da. So yeah, even though it's doing some overarching good, laying groundwork for Gus's character development and establishing that unfinished levels slash bosses can jump out of the game to complicate matters, overall this one's pretty weak. And that's viewing it in its intended order. When taken in the original airing order, the small steps forward in Gus's characterization become huge leaps backwards. I don't tolerate insubordination, mister. Not now, not ever. You're fired. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Hey, Pipples, if you liked our nonsense, why don't you give us a like, or a subscribe, or leave a comment down there somewhere? You can also do us a big solid by joining our Patreon, where you'll get to join us for live streams, get early access to the newest videos, and other such things. Daddy, can you wiggle and scream so the rabbit can see?